You can hear me? I think you might be watching uh, the wrong video. Hi, anybody who's watching the right video. Hopefully you can hear me now. Hey everybody, Troy Carpenter here at the new Goldendale Observatory. If you don't know where that is, I hope you saw some of the videos and pictures of the place. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about some grade school science within the context of astronomy, and we're going to be dispelling some old myths. Um, we are going to be going over temperatures, and this is not a boring topic. You'd be surprised how many things you can learn when discussing something as basic as thermal energy. Um, this is our number six episode of Goldendale Observations, and uh, hopefully with each passing episode, our experience, our presentation gets a little more polished. I hope you're all watching the right video. Uh, the, uh, we had some people tune into the wrong one earlier, so I'm just checking in on that. So, I would love to show you some live telescope views as a bonus tonight, but there's a lot of fog and cloud cover at the moment. I don't expect to be very successful with that. Instead, we're going to talk about, like I said, basic science and also movies. And you might be wondering why I would bring up movies, but I think that it is motion pictures that are responsible primarily for people's opinion that outer space is cold. How many of you have uh, seen a movie where a character gets blown out of an airlock and then they're very unfortunate to <laughs> freeze solid? It does not happen. We'll talk about why. I could just say right now that space is not cold, but that's not the complete story either. During this presentation, I very much hope that you will ask questions. Uh, again, I, I say this during every video, uh, Goldendale Observatory is special in that we encourage interactive presentations, so please, please ask questions during this presentation or make comments. Uh, we have some helpful friends moderating the chat. They will forward, hopefully, good questions to me. Not all the questions have to be fantastic, but we'd like them to be somewhat on topic. So, we're going to start with a little personal experiment. I would like those of you who are watching live to grab a piece of metal that's near you. For example, a chair leg or a doorknob. Any kind of metal around you that's not being heated or cooled actively. 
And I would like you to describe its temperature to me. Not, you don't you need to give me numbers. I just would like to get your, exp your experience. And I'm going to watch the chat. So grab onto anything metal near you. And I'm going to see what you, what you say about it. I'm watching the chat. I don't see anything yet. I see someone. I see some cats. That's nice. Oh, someone's watching. Cool to the touch. Colder than my hand. Mm. That's, that was an accurate answer. Colder than my hand. Uh, is it actually cold, though? Ah, look at that. Someone got it right. That metal is not actually cooler than the air in the room. That metal is not cold. Unless, unless the room is very cold, I suppose. And as someone points out, even though the temperature of the metal and the air around it are the same, the metal is a much better conductor of thermal energy. And as a result, you experience a more rapid, let's say, robbing of thermal energy from your hand. This phenomenon is not unique to your home or the metal objects around you. The thermal conductivity of a thing determines how quickly it either absorbs or grants energy. So a little definition here. Uh, heat is actually a relative concept, like so many scientific concepts. If you have two objects that are the same temperature, then they would perceive no heat between the two. Even if those objects are a million degrees, to each other they would not seem hot because there's no difference. Heat is about difference of temperature, and it's about transferring energy. Heat is a form of kinetic energy, isn't it? And this is not something we, we only see on the, the big macro scale, but of course on the micro scale. Your body or any object around you is full of atoms and molecules, and they are vibrating very quickly. And this is one of the ways that thermal energy is transferred. In fact, that happens to be the best way that thermal energy is transferred. So let's start with that. I'm going to show you the three different mechanisms by which heat are transferred. And it's important that we understand these before we get into the outer space temperature concept. All right, so check it out. All right, this animation depicts conduction. Conduction is the best way, so to speak, the most efficient way to convey thermal energy. As you can see, the hot atoms and molecules on the left are conveying their energy to the right. This happens very quickly, very readily. Solids tend to be very good conductors because the atoms and molecules are locked together in a matrix, especially metallic solids, which are a crystalline matrix. Those atoms and molecules really cannot get away, and they very easily convey energy to each other. So conduction. Not to be confused with electrical conduction, although, interestingly, electrons do have something to say about this. It's not just the atoms and molecules interacting with each other. If they're agitated enough, electrons will become freed, and those electrons will move around within the material, and they themselves can also convey thermal energy. So it's not just the atoms and molecules themselves interacting, it's also any electrons that might be flying around inside the matrix. Now, metals are famously good conductors, and I'm talking about electrical conductors right now, partly because they easily shed and gain electrons. This is because their outer shells are unstable, they're valence electrons. So those electrons are easily peeled away in the event of, for example, high thermal energy in this case or perhaps impacts from light. So the, uh, the metals are especially good, not just because they're, they're densely packed, but also because of electrons moving around within the material. Are there any questions about that? In summary, it's not a coincidence that we use the word conduction to refer both to heat conduction and also electrical conduction. All right, now. I saw someone just list the different ways that heat are conveyed. And that's right, conduction is one. The next one is convection. Now, convection does not tend to involve solids. It, it tends to involve a fluid medium. In this case, we're lighting a fire in a room, which sounds dangerous, full of gas molecules. And notice that the molecules close to the fire are heating up. But now they're doing something different than what you saw in the solid. They're moving away from the fire. They've been, they've been imbued with extra energy. They're pushing away from each other, as well as the fire. And this causes their density to drop, and they spread out, mixing around inside the room. Notice as they move away from the fire, it causes other molecules to move in towards the fire because they're filling that void. They then heat up, 
and they mix into the room. This is the process of convection. Again, it mostly applies to fluid, well, almost entirely, applies to fluid media. It might go without saying that this is a much less efficient method of conveying heat than conduction. But it's still better than the third option. Before I go into that, are there any questions about convection? There's a word you've heard before, convection oven. Hmm. They might perhaps cook with hot air. Imagine that. We'll talk about that in a second. OK, I don't see any questions about convection. Let's go to the next type. Now, radiation. Radiation is another mechanism by which something can gain or release heat. And this deals with photons, which are quantas of electromagnetic energy. Because photons are extraordinarily tiny and essentially massless, they're not very effective at doing this. So if you wish to heat something or cool something with radiation, you better use a lot of radiation or use a lot of surface area. So I just went from order of best to worst, so to speak. The uh, best way to conduct heat is conduction. The second best would be convection, and then third best would be radiation. Now, of course, there are exceptions to everything. For example, if you had a mega ultra-powerful laser, perhaps that laser would do a better job than a space heater, for example. So in outer space, for example, there are radiations that are very intense. But they still might have trouble beating the other two options. Are there any questions about this? Okay, so I'm going to quiz you now. I'm going to put up a picture, or actually a video, of a delightful campfire. Look at that. Isn't that, isn't that inviting? Isn't that pleasant? If you were to sit around the campfire, you would feel warm. I'm going to have you guys do this for me. List for me the reasons why you feel heat from the campfire. Let's see if you understand. We're going to go over this a lot more, so this is just the beginning. So tell me in the chat, why does the campfire make you feel nice and warm and toasty? Let's see what we got. I'm waiting. If I don't get it soon, I'll tell you. You might actually argue that all three mechanisms are at work. Uh, radiation, there's a lot of infrared light. Infrared is a, a very effective heat vector. So that radiation is leaving the fire. You can feel it uh, even from some distance from the fire, that infrared. Someone just mentioned convection currents. Hot air from the fire, definitely going to affect your, your uh, perception of heat from it. The combination of those two things, though, the convection and also the radiation, could perhaps heat your clothing. And so you will feel some of the heat from your own clothes heating up. And this would actually be an example of conduction. So actually, all three methods would be responsible for you feeling some heat from the fire. <laughs> Someone says, touch the flame, get burned. Yeah, don't, don't touch the flame, although that would definitely be a very efficient way of, well, getting burned. We don't want to deliberately burn ourselves in the name of science. Now, I'll show you a picture. All right, this is an oven. This is the inside of a preheated oven. You can pretend it's whatever temperature you like, although it's clearly hot. You can tell from the, the heating element there, the broiler it looks like. Many people have baked before. They have baked, for example, cookies or a pizza in the oven. And they will preheat the oven before they put the cookies in, for example, or the pizza. This sounds like a terrible idea because you are now going to open a box that has, let's say, 500 degree air. And you're going to shove your arms into it. Why are you not immediately burned? by doing this. Someone tell me in the chat. Why are you not being burned as you shove the cookie tray into the blazing hot oven? Someone tell me. Hmm. Ah, that's a good answer. Anyone else? What are you not going to do if you put that tray into the oven? What are you absolutely, definitely not going to do? What do you think? If you're smart and not dangerous and the thrill seeker. So you're not going to touch any solid surfaces in there, are you? Yeah, that's right, touch the metal. We're not going to touch the metal because the metal is a very good conductor of heat. You will burn yourself immediately. Whereas the air, also the same temperature as the air, will not burn you because it's less efficient at conveying thermal energy. 
And then there's something else going on. The, there is actually radiant heat. There is actually radiation coming from those elements on the top. Again, too slow to burn you. It's the metal rack that you want to worry about. Do not touch it. Now, uh, when your food is done cooking, you also don't want to touch the food either because the food is a solid and it is certainly a better conductor of heat than the air around it. Any questions about that? Now, humans don't always want their food or drink to heat up or cool down quickly. For example, if you have some hot soup, you might want it to stay hot. If you have some cold soda, you might want it to stay cold. And so we invented something a long time ago. What's this thing? I'm gonna, I want you to tell me, what is that thing? Interact. You will not stand it. What is that green thing? So thermos. They've been around for over 100 years, haven't they? How do they work? Are they insulated? Yes, they are. But many people think they're insulated in a traditional way, you know, perhaps with some kind of foam or fabric. But the genius of the thermos was this innovation. Let's get close here and look at this patent here. Way back in the year 1907, this patent was awarded to Mr. Berger. Imagine that name. Double-walled vessel with a space for a vacuum between walls. Hmm. And that's a very plain speak way of describing the genius of the thermos. Here's the witnesses and the lawyer. That was nice of him to sign off on this. As you can see, in the thermos bottle, let's just make that full screen. The, the uh, walls are seemingly double, and that's because they hold a secret. There is this space, this vacuum space between them. Hold that thought. I need to turn my mouse pointer back on so you can see. Hopefully you can see the, the gap there. Let me show you a more modern image of the same concept. All right, this, this is a little bit newer and a little more web-friendly picture. And as you can see, we have our delicious liquid, whatever it might be, hot or cold. And it's being isolated from the entire universe by a vacuum. So that vacuum is obviously installed, so to speak, at the factory. They suck the air out of the chamber, and you're left with these glass walls. Now, notice something important here. Glass walls with silvered surfaces. This handles radiation. You see, we already took care of mostly convection and conduction, but adding the silver to the glass also helps handle radiation. So this device, and by the way, if you're wondering how, by reflecting. So energy will be, radiation energy will be reflected back. So this device has tackled all three of the primary means of conveying heat. And they do work, don't they? Anyone, any of you who ever owned a Fermis or similar device, know that yes, it indeed will keep coffee or tea hot for most of the day, or soup, or cold stuff cold for most of the day. I mean, it will keep, for example, if you have ice in there, the ice will stay ice and it won't melt for a very long time. So this is a very effective technology, imagine that. Any questions about that? So Coca-Cola, yes, I agree, that's delicious. So maybe with cherry, I like cherry Coke. Um, now this is not a random uh, product demonstration. We're not talking about thermoses because I'm trying to sell them. What I am trying to tell you is that this very much applies to the concept of outer space and why it may not seem hot or cold, even though, again, the movies seem to tell you that it is. It isn't. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about the radiation aspect. I want to see if there's any uh, questions for us. Someone says space is a vacuum. Sure it is. We often refer to space as a vacuum. Does that mean it's completely bereft of any atoms or molecules at all? Does that mean it's completely empty? No. There are actually, uh, <laughs> Hollywood is a bad teacher, I agree. It's not a good, don't, please don't get your science lessons from, especially science fiction movies, which are really more like action movies in space, by the way. I can't tell, I, I can't even enlist the number of times I've seen someone freeze to death instantly upon being blown out of an airlock. And one of the greatest science fiction movies of all time, Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan, we have Khan himself declare that it is very cold in space when he's talking about his revenge and whatnot. No, it isn't. It's not really hot either, though, although there are hot materials. Now, I asked, 
is space actually empty? And someone has said, no, that's correct. There is stuff. How is the silver keeping the drink from getting, not getting hot when it's cold? Well, so in that case, the, there's two layers of silver. That's a good question. There's two layers of silver. So the silver on the outside is going to be rejecting any, any energy. So for, let, let's say, for example, you put the thermos out in the sun. Some of the solar heat energy that you will experience is actually radiant. It's actually radiation. And so the, the shiny silver coating will reject that. That's why there's two layers. Sometimes you want to keep heat in. Sometimes you want to keep heat out. It does both. And it does so passively without any electronics or special phase changing technologies inside of it. Very, very clever. Good question. Okay, now, outer space will often surprise people because they learn that it is more energetic than we expect. The, uh, there are temperatures at work in space which are literally measured in the millions of degrees in an area that's supposedly cold. Let me show you a picture of the bow shock encountered by a star moving through the interstellar medium. Now, this is a real picture. Zoom in here a little bit. What you're seeing here is a star plowing through the interstellar medium. The interstellar medium is that tenuous gas and dust which actually exists between star systems. Now, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, the famous space probes, are passing through the interstellar medium now as they've passed beyond the bow shock and the pause in uh, solar wind from our sun. The solar, solar wind is the term for the constant barrage of particles from the sun. And what we've discovered, much to our surprise, is that Voyager 1 and 2 are encountering temperatures in the tens of millions of degrees. Solar wind in our own solar system, much closer to the sun, is routinely around 2 million degrees Fahrenheit. And by the way, it's moving very fast, too, about 2 million miles per hour. That's easy to remember. So. That might surprise you because that sounds pretty hot, and yet the Voyagers are flying through this disruption without any trouble. Of course, thousands of satellites are orbiting Earth, and they're also experiencing these multi-million degree temperatures. How can this be? Right away, suddenly we're not talking about space being cold anymore. Now we're talking about space perhaps being incredibly hot. Again, millions of degrees in temperature. The reason it's possible for a spacecraft, or a person that, for that matter, to survive these incredible heat temperatures, these high temperatures, is because it's not just whether or not you have a material to convey heat, it's also about how much of it you have. I showed you those videos of the uh, conduction going on. In the solid, you have a lot of atoms, many billions of them. They're doing a very good job of conducting heat. And as a result, the heat conduction happens quickly and very effectively. In outer space, you might not have billions of atoms in a given volume, let's say a, a cubic meter, you might instead have hundreds of atoms. And because of that much smaller number of atoms, even though individual atoms may be very, very hot, they're not going to be able to convey a lot of energy onto you. It's an interesting topic, and this is very important. As we start to try to understand temperatures in space, it's important to understand this concept of it's not just about how hot a given molecule is or a given atom is. It's also about how able it is to convey energy. And if there's not a lot of them, it's not going to do a very good job at it. This applies to pretty much everything. If you don't have a lot of heat vectors, then they're not going to do a good job conveying heat. Now, on that subject, you might wonder how something as cold as space would have materials that are tens of millions of degrees or hundreds of millions of degrees. When you don't have a lot of atoms to go around, the ones that are there are more disrupted they're more affected by energy, for example, radiant energy. So on Earth, believe it or not, every day of your life, you might walk by devices that contain atoms and molecules agitated to hundreds of thousands, even millions of degrees, believe it or not. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Make my head big again for a second. This very dusty object, there we go, this less dusty object in my hand, this is a 5,000 volt Tesla coil, which oscillates at about 25,000 hertz. This is an electronic solid state Tesla coil. I have just turned it on, and you may notice that nothing appears to be happening. However, I have here a light bulb. And this light bulb 
contains gases at very, very low pressure. In other words, there are very few atoms in here by ratio compared to the air around it. Watch what happens when I bring this light bulb close to the Tesla coil. Notice the glowing. Anyone want to guess what gas is inside this bulb? I know someone's going to get it right. This is a pretty famous one. What's in this bulb right now? Anyone know? Neon, very good. Now, how did you know that? This is a good science question. How did you know it was neon as opposed to something else? What do you think? I'm waiting. I'm watching your answers while I'm getting some props. Someone said neon, very good. How do you know? Look at that. I got a whole stick of neon here. A whole tube of it. See the color? Color, very good. So the spectra of neon is famously orangey-red. That might confuse some of you because you might think that neon signs are all the colors in the rainbow. If you ever see a neon sign that's not this color, this orangey-red color, guess what? It's not neon. That's the science of spectroscopy. All different elements have their own unique spectra. In this case, we're using neon because neon is easy to ionize into a plasma. The high voltage from this Tesla coil is converting it from gas to plasma. It's extremely agitated right now. Part of the reason it's so agitated is because there are so few neon atoms in this tube. Because, again, it's very low pressure. Now, this may blow your mind. If you were to measure the temperature of a given neon atom in this tube, you would find that it was almost 300,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So you might be thinking, well, then how in the world is it not melting the glass? Why are you not burning right now? Why are you not bursting into flames from the 300,000 degrees Fahrenheit temperature? Because... There's so few neon atoms in there to convey heat to the glass. In fact, it's barely warm. In fact, I've, I've put my hands on neon signs that have been running for hours, and they're warm to the touch, but they're certainly not hot enough to melt the glass. Think about that. Let's see if I can make this light up. Oh, I can. You don't have to use neon, though. There's some mercury plasma. That temperature is about half that. It's like 150,000 degrees, but that's still pretty darn hot, isn't it? And yet it's not melting the glass. It's certainly not burning me. Look at that. What we're using is, in this case, high voltage energy to excite atoms. And the reason they're getting so excited is because there's so few of them. Notice that the air over this device is not glowing. Nothing's happening around it. That's because there are literally billions of air molecules around this device. And those very many billions of air molecules can readily distribute the energy from this device without getting so excited that they ionize and glow. Think about that. I'm going to turn this off for a second. I'm going to check my chat. Someone said, and dangerous, yes. Don't play with high voltage, kids, unless you know what you're doing. I shouldn't even add that part because it's never okay to play with high voltage, right? Never. No. Unless you're qualified, but you're never qualified to do it. Don't do it. Anyway. I'm going to check my uh, chat log real quick. What happens when the satellites get too much heat? It's a good question. And I'm glad. I'm so glad this question got asked. You're asking what happens when satellites overheat. Usually when people ask about satellites, they're worrying about them freezing to death. They say, why don't the satellites freeze to death? Are they worried about freezing? They must have heaters on them. Hmm. We have a lot to say about this. So, I'm going to show you a picture of a very famous thing. What's that? What are we looking at here? Anyone know what we're looking at? I like the mercury plasma. That's nice. <laughs> it is a cool color, the blue color. Ah, very good. Not only are we looking at the ISS, the International Space Station, we're specifically seeing radiators. So, you clearly tell what this thing is over here. That's obviously a solar panel. But these are space radiators. Let me show you how they work. They're all about increasing surface area. These panels are huge. So every one of these arrays, as you can see, is 75 feet long. And they're 11 feet wide. Let's do the math really quick on that. I'm actually curious myself. So 75 feet by 11. That's 825 square feet for each array. And there are six of them, so multiply that. That's 5,000 square feet. There are 5,000 square feet 
of space radiators on the International Space Station. The reason there's so much surface area being provided is because the station's primary mechanism of heat loss is infrared radiation. And this is where we're getting down to the important stuff here. Because space is a vacuum, it is not hot nor cold. It can be considered an insulator, just like the insulator inside the thermos bottle. We're using a vacuum deliberately because it lacks heat conducting atoms and molecules. In the case of outer space, it is not a deep freeze. It is indeed an insulator. And so you often worry not about freezing to death up there, but actually cooking. And so we've created this enormous 5,000 square foot radiator full of uh, ammonia, by the way, so that they can radiate as much infrared energy as possible. Speaking of infrared, there are many wavelengths that uh, can convey heat. Uh, infrared happens to be very good at it. We'll talk about why in a second. Here's some laboratory students. Let me get my head out of the way there. And here are those same laboratory students in infrared. Look at that. Kind of scary, right? So there they are in visible light. There they are in infrared. You are glowing all the time in infrared light. Thankfully, you were not glowing in invisible light, because if you were that hot, you'd be on fire. Think about that. Uh, infrared light, though, is a very common heat vector. You don't have to have something too terribly hot for it to glow in an infrared spectrum. And so everything, essentially, that's even a little bit warm will glow in infrared. But infrared is not the whole story, is it? We're going to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum right now. So this is the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We have the bottom, so to speak, radio waves, and we have the top, so to speak, gamma rays. Because we live in the future, we have the technology now to observe within every frequency regime. We can't see every single frequency. We can't observe every frequency. But at least we can study every part of the electromagnetic spectrum. All photons oscillate at a given frequency, and that determines where they fall on this chart. Notice that radio waves have very long wavelengths, in other words, a very low frequency. High energy photons have a very high frequency and a short wavelength. And notice this unit here, EV energy. These are this is for this is refers to electron volts. Electron volts is an important uh, scientific measurement tool when dealing with quantum physics. When you're trying to figure out exactly how energetic a given atom or molecule is, this is very important. This is not what a normal person would use when conveying how hot something appears. Because that's more than just how energized a given atom is. Because like we've talked about a bit tonight, you know, I have a whole bunch of atoms distributing energy evenly or efficiently, then they may not seem all that hot, even though individual atoms might be getting highly agitated by some, some sort of radiation, for example. The little cartoons on the top indicate the size of the waves. And as you can see, radio waves can be as big as buildings. And that's not actually not saying enough, because they can be even bigger than that. Theoretically, ultra-low frequency radio waves can be as big as a planet. Whereas visible light, the waves are about the size of single-celled organisms. This is why when you study very, very tiny things, sometimes you can't use visible light, because the waves are actually too large. Speaking of which, you may have noticed that the quality of the image of those students dropped. Notice how the image is much less sharp in infrared than it is in visible light. That's because, literally, infrared waves are larger and so you need to build a larger collector if you want to get the same resolution that a small collector would get with, for, for example, visible wavelengths. Think that's interesting. That comes up a lot in space science. The, uh, the resolution of a device is strongly uh, affected by the size of the waves. For example, this is a picture of the planet Jupiter in visible wavelengths. And this is another picture of the planet Jupiter in radio wavelengths. Notice the quality of the image is very poor because radio waves are very big. But also notice that the radio waves allow us to see things that are otherwise invisible. And that's because the temperatures of the, in this case, particles trapped in Jupiter's magnetic field are too low to glow in visible light, but they are high enough to glow in radio light. The energy of a thing determines the wavelength that it emits. And this is a big deal when we're talking about temperature, because really, in a way, it all comes down to temperature. How energetic something is, how kinetically energetic it is, determines the wavelengths of light that it emits. On that subject, let me show you something. I'm going to show you some 
various wavelengths of electromagnetic energy. Now, at the top, you can see we have some relatively low frequency waves, and then on the bottom, we have some very high frequency waves. Someone tell me, which one is radio and which one is gamma ray? Someone tell me. Let's start with radio. Which one is radio? Top or bottom? Someone tell me. I'm not going to move on until someone answers. Top is radio. Very good. You got it right. So then by a process of elimination, what's the bottom? All right. That's, that's good. Someone got the, that's got the, uh, someone got the uh, colors. That's good. So what's the uh, bottom? Gamma rays. Good job. Check it out. There's our, there are your labels. So the more energetic the atom, the higher the frequency of light it will emit. And this is where we really start to appreciate the energy levels in the universe. Because now I'm going to show you the temperatures associated with these wavelengths. All right, now I've converted, normally these would be conveyed in Kelvin, and really they should be, but in this case we're going to use Fahrenheit because we're familiar with it. Notice radio waves start being emitted at essentially the bottom. In case you're not aware, negative 459 degrees is essentially absolute zero. Slightly above it. Yeah. Notice microwaves don't require that much more energy. Negative 442 degrees Fahrenheit atoms will emit microwaves. By the way, this also means that radio waves and microwaves are very bad at conveying heat because they tend to be emitted by things that are not hot. In fact, something like an inert dust cloud floating through the cosmos will, believe it or not, emit some radio waves. Just you walking around in your house, you emit radio waves, believe it or not, because of, for example, high voltage discharge between your feet on the floor because of static electricity or even just the tiny amount of heat created by the friction of your clothes moving against each other will cause you to emit radio waves. If you could see radio waves, the world would be very confusing indeed because everything would be glowing all the time. And you'd have, very hard time, you'd have a very difficult time trying to d differentiate things. Of course, the same is true of many, many, many of these other waves as well. Now, microwaves are very important when studying the entire universe. Some of you might be aware of this. This is the cosmic microwave background. This is not the W map, which used to be the most famous example of this. This is a, a much newer map from the uh, European Space Agency's Planck satellite. This is the microwave re residue, so to speak. This is the remnant radiation from the Big Bang. It didn't start out as microwave radiation, but it has been stretched by cosmic expansion into the microwave wavelengths. And you may have heard that with ordinary off-the-shelf equipment, including television sets, you can actually tune in a small percentage of this microwave radiation. This incredibly, incredibly dim afterglow of the Big Bang is measurable because even though it's incredibly dim and incredibly weak, it's not nothing. It's not zero. We're not talking about particles that are at zero degrees Kelvin, which is absolute zero. They're warm enough to emit microwaves, in this case, actually higher energies than microwaves, but they've been stretched into microwave, and we can measure it. Let's continue with our little temperature uh, gallery here. So infrared starts out at negative 280 degrees. So again, you don't have to have something very hot to emit infrared. But infrared is a wide band, and we're actually also encompassing something called submillimeter wavelength in this particular line as well. So there's a lot of infrared and submillimeter before that, after that. And then you have this big jump. Look at that, visible light. Temperature of 2.6 thousand. That K is for kilo, not for Kelvin. So 2.6 thousand degrees, so 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit, is a high enough temperature that something will begin to emit visible light. Uh, light bulb filaments, for example, will be at least that hot. Invisible light wavelengths can go up over 20,000 uh, degrees. But then look at this, ultraviolet is way higher, 180,000 degrees for something to emit UV. Now, when you start to get into energy levels this high, we start to refer to this radiation as ionizing radiation. And the reason we call it ionizing radiation is it conveys enough energy to knock electrons off of an atom, converting them into a plasma. Now, this is the reason that ultraviolet light causes things to decay, because it can often energize chemical reactions. You, you saw this thing earlier, the mercury. This is actually a mercury tube from a light bulb. 
These wear out, as you know, fluorescent light bulbs and mercury vapor lights don't last forever, partly because they rely on infra, uh, excuse me, uh, ultraviolet radiation to do their jobs, and that radiation is actually causing undesirable chemical reactions to take place with the filament inside the device and ends up causing their destruction. So chemical reactions tend to occur readily when you have lots of ionizing radiation available. And of course, the energy levels only get more intense from there. So we have x-rays, 18 million degrees Fahrenheit to emit x-rays. And the gamma rays, 1.8 billion, that's a B, 1.8 billion degrees Fahrenheit. That's how hot something has to be to emit gamma rays. And yet, the universe is awash in gamma rays because the universe is a violent and powerful place. And of course, humans can create gamma rays too. We have, for example, nuclear weapons can do this and nuclear reactors can create gamma rays, yeah. So it is possible for human beings to generate temperatures of this magnitude. And if that seems shocking, I wanna remind you, you don't have to excite a lot of atoms to these temperatures, it could be just a handful. And this is something, again, you can do at home. I talked about the neon bulb, 300,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but we're not limited to that. You have, at some point in your life, perhaps received a dentist x-ray. That means that some device inside of that dentist office was actually producing photons oscillating at these levels of energy, 18 million degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to, we're going to show you a video about that in a second. I'm going to pause, though, before I show you a video about x-ray production and see about questions. So I'm looking at questions here. Yes, silver, yes. Okay, we're not, not having tons of questions tonight, but that's okay. So, ooh, cancer treatment often involves gamma rays. That's right. How do we produce them? Well, one of the ways we do it is by subjecting a very small number of atoms to extremely high voltage. So watch this. This is fun. There is a YouTube channel I like a lot. Uh, this guy in England, uh, his channel is called Photonic Induction, which is a silly statement, silly term. And... Uh, he does dangerous things with high voltage, things that you will not do at home. So here is, uh, I'm going to pause this. This is a, a pair of electrodes attached to a large transformer. He actually has a utility scale in transformer in his attic. And he is, in this case, producing an arc that is about 300,000 volts at significant and dangerous current. Now watch this. We have here a dose meter. This is not a typical Geiger counter. See how it says Geiger and Mueller counter. These devices became popular after the Fukushima disaster. People buy these because they're not intended just to tell you random radiation levels, but to tell you about dosage. And uh, it measures in micro ser uh, serviettes. So as you can see, 0 0.06, that's actually about a background radiation level that's completely harmless. Watch. So he's got the arc burning here, 300,000 volts. As you can see, nothing's happening. But now we're going to use a vacuum tube. This vacuum tube, let me go, actually, let me go back just so you can understand what we're talking about here. Hold that thought. So he's using an arc here of 300,000 volts in the air, and we're not seeing any dangerous radiation. However, like I was saying, watch what happens when we employ a vacuum tube. In the case of a vacuum tube, you have a vacuum. There are very few atoms in this device. The air has been deliberately evacuated from it. Watch what happens when he applies the 300,000 volts to this. You might see some arcing and sparking going on here. Notice the meter up here is up to 7, 9, almost 10. He's going to zoom in here. So let's just say, let me move that over there. So almost 10 microserviettes. That's dangerous. So he just produced dangerous x-rays with the exact same amount of energy as he used to produce that arc you saw because he was subjecting a very small number of atoms to these energies. When he was blasting the arc in open air, he was subjecting billions of atoms to those energies, and so none of them got excited enough to emit x-radiation. But as you can see, by reducing the number of atoms, he was able to get those that were left to oscillate at very high energy levels and emit dangerous x-rays. Now, this might remind you of something. How many of you remember a CRTs, cathode ray tube televisions? Most of us grew up with them. If you've ever 
taken one apart because you're the tinkering type, you may have seen a very surprising and maybe even alarming warning. There's a label in there that says, do not disassemble X-ray shield. There is a dangerous X radiation contained within. It's true, you should never operate a television without that important shield because the vacuum tube that is the cathode ray tube does have a few atoms in it, and the electrons at play are powerful enough to cause them to emit X-rays. Imagine that. So it's not about just the energy level. It's also about how many atoms are there to distribute the energy. This is an important concept when we're discussing outer space and the reason that things are energized or energetic or not. I would like to see if there's any questions about that before I move on. I'm going to, I'm going to play that video again because it's fun. Here we go. Questions? That's a good question. Heat versus temperature. So heat implies transfer of energy. And like I said, if you have two objects of the same temperature, then they will actually experience no heat between them. Again, even though they might be very, quote, hot. So temperature can be measured directly with that electron volt unit I showed you in that chart. So electron voltage allows us to measure the actual excitement of a given atom. So some of the atoms in here are very excited indeed, and we'll have electron voltages that are relatively high. But even though they might have individually high energies, they will readily convey that energy to surrounding atoms because there are so many, and the overall energy level will drop. So it's not just about... Again, how much energy you have, but also how much material or surface area there is to accept it or radiate it. That's a good question. Any other questions about that? What do you mean, how do T? How, how do T? I do not understand this sentence, so I will continue speaking. Now, I mentioned to you that the Voyager space probes are moving through interstellar media, which is really just atomic hydrogen and helium, that is millions of degrees. And I mentioned that solar wind, which bathes our solar system at all times, is again, millions of degrees. But because it's so thinly distributed, because it's so tenuous, space probes don't get very hot, theoretically. Now, something can get hot. The International Space Station can experience on its sun side about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. On its night side, so to speak, its shadow side, negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit. That can be bad. You don't want temperature swings because they're bad for equipment. They can cause materials to crack. It can cause electronics to fail. And so we employ a material that you've probably all seen. This is called ML MLI, multi-layer insulation. And this has been around since the 60s. It is actually a pretty low-tech product. Here's a, this is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter covered with it. Oh, by the way, this is the Huygens probe, which landed on Saturn. This is Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is orbiting Mars. And this is an image of MLI. All it is is metallized mylar, like the type of material you might see in a fire blanket. And then it has a material in between, which creates physical strength, but also gaps. There are gaps between the layers of foil. And this is very much like the thermos bottle, where you're trying to reflect heat back into the inside to keep it warm. And you want to reflect heat out that might be coming in from, for example, the sun. So the idea of MLI, which again covers pretty much every space probe we've ever seen, is to, is to help reduce the severity of temperature swings so that something can remain warm but not too toasty and not freeze to death either. Any questions about MLI, multi-layer insulation? All right, so I'm going to show you something cool. Uh, last year, China made some news. They landed this little guy. This is the U-2 or Jade Rabbit. Two, so U-2-2, two, two, this is the second one. This is a rover that was actually for a while driving around on the far side of the moon. It's very unsafe or difficult to land things on the far side of the moon. We talked a little bit about that last week with our moon show because you can't talk to these uh, devices directly because the moon's in the way, so you have to use satellites. What's cool about this picture is this is from the lander, the mothership, taking a video of the rover as it drove down the ramp. Now, here's a picture of the mothership from the rover. So this is the Chang'e lander, and this is currently sitting on the, dark, the I almost said dark side of the moon, there's no such thing, the far side of the moon. Now, this particular mission and many missions before it 
had some liabilities to overcome. We were all very concerned about the probe freezing to death. But we've talked quite a bit tonight in the last, uh, last 52 minutes about space not really being all that cold after all. So why are they so worried about specifically lunar probes, specifically objects on the moon freezing to death? What do you think? I want to see if we can understand this. Someone tell me, why is it that we worry so much about landers? That's a hint. On the moon, freezing to death. But we don't seem to worry about satellites doing it. What do you think? I'm watching the chat. I'm not seeing the answer. Come on, guys, tell me. Why is the moon? Oh, because of the fuel? No. No. Moon body conduction. Very good. Unlike a satellite, which is flying through that insulator, that vacuum of outer space, a lander is sitting on the ground, and that ground becomes very cold indeed because lunar night is about 14 days long. So 14 days of darkness, by the way, followed by 14 days of daylight, lunar day and night, 14 days each, about, roughly. So that thing is sitting in darkness for 14 days, and any heat, any energy in the machine is being sucked out by that freezing cold ground. So, landing on something makes thermal concerns much more prescient because you will lose your equipment to freezing, and that does happen. And we, Many, many missions have been lost because of a machine or device freezing to death because it was sitting on that cold, cold ground for days or weeks in darkness. Not only was it dark, there was no sun to heat them, but the ground itself was robbing the instrument of, of energy the whole time it was sitting there. Someone mentions the moon has little atmosphere. That's true. So there, it's, it's pretty much a uh, uh, instantaneous temperature swing. Once the sun sets, the temperature drops very quickly because you have no thermal moderation caused by convection, as you would on a planet like Earth, where we have a nice thick atmosphere, which can move warm and cool air around. This is why the temperature doesn't instantaneously plummet as soon as the sun sets. Although it does cool, doesn't it? Imagine that much faster, that process unfolding much more quickly on the moon with its lack of air. These are all, these are all good answers. So if I were you, I would not hang out on the lunar surface in a spacesuit at lunar night because you will freeze quickly. This is one of the challenges if we decide to live on the moon is how will we deal with these rapid and, and very severe temperature swings? And there are technologies that help us. Sometimes you can get free energy, so, so to speak, some extra heat from, for example, radioactive materials. Uh, many spacecraft use radioisotope thermoelectric generators. So you have plutonium, which is fissile plutonium, the type which you would use for a bomb. And that, that heat is used to generate electricity, but it also gives you a little bit of free uh, warming energy. So important. That, that is an issue on a moon mission, is how to keep everything warm. You, that, you might think, oh, well, we'll just install some electric heaters. That solves that problem. Well, I don't know if you're aware, but electric heaters actually use a lot of power, and solar panels can only collect so much energy. So you would need a very large solar f collector, indeed, if you wish to warm uh, a facility with electric heaters. That, electric heaters are t tend to be used as an emergency solution because they're so extremely energy-wasting. All right, questions, questions. Let's see some questions. Questions. Keep. I'm going to put, uh, click around a little bit in my my uh, slides while you're pondering things. You know, we humans invent products that are intended to. Can can we crack the moon base? Can we? Is someone saying, could you bury yourself in the moon? Yes, you could. We could land and bury equipment. Yes. Um, I'm reading the questions. Is ionization harmful to humans? Uh, yes, it can be. It can cause mutations and cause cancers and other illnesses. And that's, by the way, why you should avoid ionizing radiation and not play with high-energy physics demonstrators unless you know what you're doing. Someone asked about how he was generating that arc in the video. That was 300,000 volts from a transformer taking the regular power from his house and increasing it from 100, actually he's, he's British, so 250 volts AC at 50 hertz to... 300,000 volts AC at 50 hertz. The reason you can see the arc is because the air is being converted into a plasma by the high energy. That's a good segue because I want to show you something. Many of you, any of you who know me know I use this picture a lot. I'm very fond of it. This is the Orion Nebula. 
This is an example of a stellar nursery where baby stars are being born. Now, those baby stars are very, very energetic. There's some right there. This little cluster of young stars are emitting tremendous quantities of ultraviolet radiation, which is exciting the lightweight atomic hydrogen in this cloud to a plasma state, just like the neon in my uh, little light bulb there. So high energy from, in this case, stars, will ionize lightweight gases in the universe and you get big glowing nebulas. That's a good question. Get some more pictures here. This is the Rosette Nebula. Again, a huge cloud of hydrogen, again, being ionized into a plasma by the extremely intense ultraviolet radiation of those baby stars. These are newborn stars forming inside the nebula. And their radiation is responsible for the glowing of the nebula. Not all nebulas are glowing. Some are what we call dark. And it's pretty self-explanatory. They're dark. They block light. They're not glowing because they're not being excited by the radiation of a nearby star. Is it cold or hot? That's what's so amazing about this. This material will literally be hundreds of thousands or even millions of degrees. Let's go back to that, that video so I can tell you the exact answer. Since I told you it's ultraviolet radiation responsible for the ionization of those nebulas, notice that that material must be at least 180,000 degrees, and it's probably in the millions of degrees. Yeah. By the way, there are other phenomena in the universe that produce X-rays and gamma rays as well, so even higher energies. But yeah, even though it's hot, you could fly through that nebula in a spacesuit and be completely unharmed because even though every individual atom is very excited and energetic, they're not going to be able to convey heat efficiently into your spacecraft or your spacesuit because there's so few of them. And that's one of the basic concepts I wanted to convey tonight is people be because people become confused. Let me show you an amazing example of what often confuses people. This is a picture of a... I'm going to flip that. There you Actually, that's not better. This is better. So this is a pair of galaxy clusters. What was the name of these? I forgot their names. Abel 401 and Abel 399. There, this glow has been superimposed from X-ray data and also microwave data filtering through the material. What we are discovering is that there is an incomprehensibly vast field of lightweight material that is being energized to a temperature of 144 million degrees Fahrenheit. So imagine thousands of light years of material that's 144 million degrees Fahrenheit. This is the kind of thing that confuses people because if we learn about space, we think it's cold, whatever. Then you, then someone tells you, oh yeah, we just found this utterly immense cloud of material that's over 100 million degrees Fahrenheit. People are like, how can that be? It can be because the material is so thinly, so loosely, so undensely, that's not a word, <laughs> distributed. It's so, it's so rarefied by, the, by its expansion in an enormous universe that these individual atoms may not encounter each other. There are areas in this picture where if you were there, you might be able to count the number of atoms in a cubic meter on, a, on one hand. That's essentially a perfect vacuum. And those atoms are very savagely affected by the various forms of radiation that fill our universe because they can't get rid of the energy. They're very easily agitated. So yeah, uh, imagine that. Material that hot that you could fly through and you wouldn't feel a thing. You wouldn't notice any problem whatsoever. So hot because mostly of the radiation from the many billions of stars in these two galaxy clusters. By the way, most of these dots you see on the screen are not actually stars. These are galaxies filled with billions of stars. This whole, this whole assembly is over one billion light years away. And because we're so incredibly far from it, we can see the entire relationship between these two clusters of galaxies. Think about that. All right. How does the nebula produce the color we see? All elements have their own unique spectra. Let me go back to the... Uh, view here. For example, someone very astutely figured out that this light bulb contained neon because it has a specific color. This is the emission spectra of neon. All elements have their own unique spectra. That's worth a tangent. Hold that thought. So here's some examples of absorption spectra. Watch this. Okay, these rainbows are the light of a bunch of stars. These are not famous stars. As you can see, they do not have pretty names. And uh, I might as well, I might as well uh, put my head back there. Sure, there I am. So these, these colors, these rainbow colors are actually color temperature. This is, con this is continuous spectra. But you might notice 
that there are black lines. Those black lines are what we call absorption lines, and they correspond to known elements because, again, all elements on the periodic table have their own unique spectra. And all isotopes do, too. For example, I happen to know that this very prominent double yellow is sodium. So that's some sodium emission. You can tell what something is made out of or what, uh, what it's uh, exciting, what material is exciting by the color that it either emits or absorbs. This is the science of spectroscopy, and it's one of the most important sciences. It finds its way into many scientific disciplines. Being able to identify something, also if it's molecular or atomic, what isotope it is, all these things are very important to scientists, and simply by studying the color of light, you can do it. And by the way, this is not unrelated to our topic tonight because spectroscopy is not limited to visible wavelengths. It is also used in X-ray, for example. There's X-ray spectroscopy, and uh, it's one of the reasons, that, one of the ways they find gold in the universe is actually X-ray spectra. Um, so we can use uh, the entire electromagnetic spectrum to figure out what stuff is made out of. That's a good question. All right, we're going to wrap it up in the next, let's say, seven minutes. I like the color. I like these questions we're getting. So the hottest and coldest temperatures. Uh, this is funny. Someone asked the coldest. If you saw our My Moon show last week, believe it or not, one of the coldest places ever measured, that's, I, want to, I want to be very specific, measured, that doesn't mean it's the coldest place in the universe, is a, a crater on the north pole of the moon, which is only a few degrees above absolute zero. That's because that particular crater is so deep that it is, uh, it is always in shadow. And so it's cold soaked to the extreme. As far as maximum temperatures, we don't know. You could make up a number and it would probably be fine, like quadrillion degrees, because there have been some astonishingly violent events in our universe's history, including not only the Big Bang, but also supernova explosions. You're not going to believe me when I say this. It's, it's one of the most incredible things to know. A supernova explosion can release as much energy in a few months as the sun will during its entire life cycle, which, by the way, is over 10 billion years. That's because the supernova explosion is converting a significant portion of that star's mass directly into energy. I'm not even going to bother trying to put a number on the temperatures involved because I, I don't think there's going to be a convenient word to use to describe that number. We're talking about temperatures that might as well be gobbledygook. I could say a, a gajillion degrees. And of course, if I did look it up, I could give you a number, but it would have to, re it would require scientific notation to convey it. So, um, yeah, as far as temperatures, we don't know of a maximum temperature. We don't know. We don't know if quantum physics demands that there is a sort of maximum uh, thermal state. But we do know that there is a minimum thermal state in the form of absolute zero. Although it has been demonstrated now mathematically that it's probably impossible for absolute zero to exist naturally. And in fact, it may even be possible to. It, it might might actually be impossible to create it as well. We've gotten very close. But yeah, absolute zero is essentially. No, actually, no, you know what? Let's do something fun. I'll show you absolute zero. This is, this is kind of a joke answer. So you see here, here's our conduction happening. I'm going to pause it. There you go. There's absolute zero. Everything just stops. As far as we know, it's never happened. But we get close. We've gotten close. Let me, let me slow it down. There, there you go. So we got stuff real slow, but we never got it to freeze like that. Yeah. Good question. Theia hitting Earth. That was oh, that was probably hundreds of thousands of degrees and stayed hot for a long time. Now, on that subject, I said I'm wrapping it up. Um, I would like to talk about very briefly some exceptions, some loopholes to what we've talked about tonight. We've talked about the fact that you tend to lose energy in the form of, in this case, conduction or convection or radiation. But there are some other mechanisms. For example, gravitational heating, which is actually which actually causes conductive heating in the form of uh, friction. But we've learned that Jupiter's moons are warm because of gravitational interaction. Now it's been known for a long time that Jupiter's moon Io was volcanic because of the force of Jupiter's gravity stretching him out. But now it turns out that four of Jupiter's moons, the famous Galilean moons, are actually heating each other gravitationally. So that's another way to convey energy in the universe is gravity pulling on things, which creates internal friction, which makes heat. Let me give you uh, some another loophole. And this one's a little more extreme. This is an artistic rendering of a magnetar. A magnetar is a form of neutron star, in case you're not aware. 
Neutron stars are dead stars. These are the collapsed remnants of, of very high mass, in fact, supermassive stars. These are not as extreme a dead star as a black hole, but they are extreme enough that you have the mass of several sun-type stars crushed into a space about the size of a city. So let's say maybe 20 miles across. Mind-boggling density. And yet, it's as absolutely mind-boggling as that density is, it's still less dense than a black hole. Now, neutron stars are so unbelievably heavy and so unbelievably dense that very weird things happen. Like, for example, protons and electrons being forced together to create new neutrons, and neutrons physically touching each other because the gravity is so intense. Now, one of the ways these events, these pairings, shed energy is via neutrino emission. Neutrinos are ultra low mass particles which move at the speed of light, and a neutron star can actually lose heat via neutrino emission. As a result, a neutron star will actually cool down in only a few million years. Now, that may not sound like a short time, but there are hot objects in our universe that will remain hot for incomprehensible time periods, expanses of time that are hard to believe. So neutron stars, interestingly, have found like a loophole where they can shed heat more quickly than usual because they found a way, so to speak, of, of emitting energy in the form of neutrino emission. Most objects cannot do this because the conditions required to emit large numbers of neutrino, neutrinos are extremely intense, extremely violent. So let's talk about the last hot things in the universe. This is a very famous star. This is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of the brightest star in the sky. This is Sirius, specifically Sirius A. Sirius A is only 8.6 light years away, and you can see it every night in the wintertime. It's the brightest star out there. It's to the lower left of famous Orion. The reason I specify Sirius A is this picture also includes Sirius B. So Sirius B is a white dwarf. 97%, I'm going to repeat this, 97% of all stars will end their lives as a white dwarf. White dwarfs are the least extreme type of stellar remnant. Our sun will collapse into a white dwarf upon its death. White dwarfs are extremely dense, about the size of a planet like Earth, but they have a significant portion of the star's original mass. And because of that extreme density, and because of the fact that they're in a universe which is effectively an insulator, believe it or not, white dwarfs can remain hot for hundreds of billions of years. In fact, it is expected that the last hot objects in the cosmos will be white dwarfs. So if you want to think about some far, 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 far flung future where some form of life continues to exist in our universe, it's likely they will find a way to perhaps harness the energy of white dwarfs because indeed they will remain hot. Even though they're dead, these are dead stars, the, the original energy of their living heat has been condensed into a very small package. So you're going from a surface temperature, in the case of the sun, of 10,000 degrees to tens of millions of degrees because of surface area reduction. Remember that whole thing about surface area? A white dwarf star is much, 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 much smaller, yet it still has the energy, the residual energy from the living star, and so it remains hot for a very, 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 very long time. So when people talk about the heat death of the universe, which will be trillions of years from now, the uh, white dwarfs may well be the last hot things out there. All right. So, so someone said, yeah, Sirius A and B. Yeah, so that's right. So this is an image. And by the way, it's very difficult to image Sirius B. And some people will actually use it as kind of a test for their telescopes to see if they can see it. You have to have very high quality, very high contrasty objects or optics to resolve Sirius B. Sirius A, no problem. Brightest star in the sky, like I said. You can see it easily. All right, so wrapping it up. Final questions. Questions. Final thoughts. Have we tried mimic energy sources for energy creation on Earth? Mimic? Well, if, so stars are powered by thermonuclear fusion, and that is indeed a, a subject of intense and expensive study. And we keep trying very hard to build the next viable fusion reactor. Fusion reactors are actually very common, and you can build one yourself. But ones that produce more energy than they take to operate, that so far eludes us. The new ITER uh, reactor being built over in Europe might finally do it, and they expect to, to achieve net positive energy, energy out of that reactor by the year 2035. So 15 years or so, maybe we'll finally have a viable nuclear fusion reactor that's more than just a science experiment, but actually a power source. All stars, all of stars, derive the majority of their energy from thermonuclear fusion. It is the powerhouse of a star, specifically the fusion of hydrogen into helium. 
while a star is doing this, while it's, while it's uh, generating power via fusion of hydrogen, we call it the main sequence. That's the, the, the let's say, the most common uh, time period in a star, and often longest time period in a star's life cycle. Okay, so let's do one more question, and then we'll be signing off. This has been a good, I think, I hope, I hope this has been productive. Have we learned anything? So a star reaches the energy levels necessary to generate fusion via gravity. So stars are very heavy things. Let me bring up a picture. This might be fun for you. So here's a bunch of famous stars. All these stars have names. One of them is the sun. Which one do you think is the sun? I'll give you uh, 10 seconds. Which one of these stars is the sun? I'm waiting. The smallest one? Don't be ridiculous. That's correct. That's right. Good job. So the tiny little dot there is the sun. Our sun is a G2 yellow dwarf. Even though it is a very small star, there are smaller stars known as red dwarfs, and they are the most common stars in the universe. Low mass stars and intermediate mass stars all die as white dwarfs, but some of these other stars won't. For example, famous Betelgeuse and Antares, they will explode as type 2 supernovas, and both of them will give rise to neutron stars, which we talked about earlier. None of the stars on this uh, on this chart are heavy enough to become black holes. And by the way, that kind of answers your question. A star generates the enormous heat to trigger thermonuclear fusion. Notice the term heat, that at atomic interaction, that kinetic energy, is the, is the prime mover that makes fusion possible. The enormous heat is resultant from incredible pressure. And by the way, in case it hasn't already been implied during this presentation, Pressure, pressure equals temperature because more pressure means more atomic interaction. And the pressure is resultant from tremendous gravity. And, of course, the gravity is the result of tremendous mass. Our sun has 300,000 times the mass of Earth. And there are stars in this chart that are many dozens of times that. Oh, by the way, you might think that Betelgeuse or Antares, because they're millions of times larger in volume, would have millions of times the mass. That is actually impossible. A star cannot become that massive, or it will instantly collapse into a black hole. We call that a direct collapse object. And none of the stars on this chart are anywhere close enough, anywhere near that, that, that weight. We think that in the early universe, direct collapse was a much more common phenomenon. But in the modern universe, the stars are more opaque because they're full of heavy elements that did not exist when the universe was new. And as a result, there's a certain cutting off point for stars during their formation where they tend to not have more than 150 solar masses. And even then, those are extraordinarily rare stars. Stars that massive will become black holes upon their death. But we estimate that in the early universe, in the first generation of stars, and by the way, there's three generations of stars, we estimate that the first generation could have achieved masses as high as 400 solar masses. So there might have been these ultra-massive stars in the early universe that would have lived very short life cycles. Because the more massive a star is, the more rapidly it consumes its fuel and loses stability and loses hydrostatic equilibrium and collapses. By the way, you don't want a, a big massive star for a sun because, like I said, they live a very short time as a result of that, that factor I just brought up. All right, so this is the first one. We, the name Betelgeuse is part of a sentence, which means the shoulder or the armpit of the Great One because Betelgeuse is the shoulder of Orion, the hunter, one of the best human-shaped constellations in the sky. So yeah, that's where that word comes. It's from a sentence. It's a, I think it's Arabic. Yeah, many of these names are Arabic. Because of the great astronomers of ancient Persia, uh, and the, the, they had their, uh, their ziggurats, and they were able to study the motions of the sky and named a lot of things. And we kept those names because they were so good at what they did. Humans have been very good at astronomy long before computers and telescopes existed. Because people had a lot of time on their hands, they were able to stay out all night observing the sky and observing patterns. Yeah. I went over my time promise, but uh, that was a good topic. I thought it was worth mentioning. Well, again, I hope this has been fun. I hope you're all able to find the video no problem. And if you couldn't, please send us an email because we'd like to understand the issue. Some people are having trouble finding these videos. Um, and uh, I, hope, uh, I hope this has been worth your time. We're, we're doing this every week at 7 o'clock Sunday nights. Next week, we'll be talking about the 3D universe. We'll talk about the fact that as you gaze across the night sky, you're looking at a, at a lot of different things at a lot of different distances. You have an extraordinary perspective when you look out. Some things are very close to us, and some things are extraordinarily far away. We'll talk about that. 
Uh, that also segues into a natural event going on right now as we speak. If you haven't noticed, look to the south. After sunset, you'll see two bright things. That would be Jupiter and Saturn, which are moving ever closer for what we call a great conjunction at the end of December. So that'll be cool to see. We'll talk about that too next month as one of our shows. So uh, because this is YouTube Live, I strongly encourage you to like and subscribe. Uh, it helps us out. And the more people that watch these videos, the uh, more likely we are to continue this little service of ours. And hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, we'll get to reopen our facility for in-person visits as well. But we won't necessarily end our live shows when we do that. We'll see. We're going we're gonna to work on that. So you see how that works out. So, okay. Well, this has been fun for me. I enjoy this topic of temperatures. I think it's important to know that the universe is not as cold as people think. It's a little more complicated than that. We live in a great insulator. So, I hope you've had fun. Hope I see you next week. Stay curious. Keep asking questions. Have a good night.